that was, that was my wife. You just met her indirectly. All right, so final arc length parameterization for a circle of radius two traced out by the vector value function, R of t is equal to two cosine ti plus two sine tj. All right, now, aside from the fact that it just flat out tells you that it's a circle, there, there is that nagging question possibly of, okay, well, if they didn't tell us it was a circle, how would we know it was a circle? Well, uh, circle is a two-dimensional figure. So we could put this vector value function into Desmos. It, when you're working in two dimensions, Desmos is the way to go. So you can put it in, in component form, two cosine two cosine t, and then two sine t. over some reasonable domain. You know, in this case, it's zero to two pi, so they flat out give it to us. But whatever it takes to get a sense of the path is all you need to do. All right. Aside from the fact that we actually played around with this a little bit in the beginning of unit one, where we would convert over from uh, polar to rectangular form, from parametric to rectangular form, and really a vector value function is just a series or a set of parametric equations that are written in vector form. So once you make that realization, you, you start to come to grips with the fact that, oh, that stuff that we learned about parametrics, that one is never going away. So that's good news, bad news. But also you can rely on the stuff that you spent a lot of time getting to know back in that first unit. So that, that's hopefully considered to be a good thing, I would think. Okay. So what we're gonna do is really the same thing that we did before. You know, if you just kind of follow the recipe for number four, or even my little side example, we want T to vary. We want T to not just be some function that is linear in nature. I want it to be unlimited in terms of whatever a function that could exist would be. So I'm gonna let T equal U or U of T if you want, so I'll write u of t, but written as, as t equals u, All right? And so then we would have r of u of t. So it's still a function of t, but we're kind of broadening our horizons here by saying it's still going to have the same form, the same structure as 2 cosine t, 2 sine t, except we can now input a function u in terms of t, right? So we could write this as two cosine u of t. And I'm gonna put it in vector form, a component form, uh, two sine u of t. Poor quality, close parentheses, let me fix that, and then close the brackets. Now, if we write it as R of u, just to keep it simple, two cosine u, two sine of u. That, you know, that intermediate step may seem unnecessary, but I like to incorporate that in there because what people have struggled with in the past is like, how can you just make a t into a u? Well, I'm not really making a t into a u, I'm just kind of broadening by saying, T is kind of a subset of U of T. U of T is any function that could exist involving a T. Originally, it was such that U of T was equal to T. But what I wanna say is what if, what if it was U of T equal to T squared? You know, I could put a little power of two in here. Whoa, look at that. But now look at that. You know, when you correct for it, it's like, oh, it's the same thing. Right, in terms of the path that's traced out. Now, how it traces out that path may be different. You know, I could put a two here, put a two there, still the same path, right? It's when you get into, let's say, transcendental functions, you know, ones that uh, transcend algebra. You know, that, that's when things start going a little crazy, but let's say we're just putting a polynomial function, look at that baby. But minus 
C, as long as the argument contained within the trig function is the same, still going to trace out the same figure, right, in two dimensions. All right. So then what I would do is find the derivative r prime of u. Now, the trig function, that's fine. You might think uh, chain rule stuff like that, but we're taking the derivative with respect to u. All right. So I'm writing r prime of u, but we're thinking of it as dr du. Right, so negative two sine of u, two cosine of u. Right, because when we write r prime of, of anything, it could be interpreted as r r prime as in like dr d theta, dr dt, dr d whatever. You know, uh, here we're saying with respect to u. Right, so then I'm going to find the magnitude. So we square each component, add them together. So four sine squared u plus four cosine squared u under a nice radical. Hopefully it'll be a nice radical. It is a nice radical, it's nice. All right. To factor out the four, so factoring out a square root of four, which becomes a two times the square root Got to exaggerate the radical so it actually looks right. Sine squared u plus cosine squared u. That's Pythagorean identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. Square root of one is one. The principal square root. All right. So two times one is going to give you a two. Now you might look at this and say, oh, so it's the radius. And I say, yeah, but only for a circle. You know, and that's only because the, the radius is constant. So the magnitude of each vector that makes up that circle, that traces out that circle, is going to be the same, specifically two, right? So we have a constant radius. Doesn't always play out that way. And when it, honestly, when it doesn't play out that way, you get something like number four, right? But in this case, it's nice, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to integrate in order to find the arc length. We're going to integrate over zero to t. Now we would say t sub zero, but since we can decide on the lower bound, we're going to go with the idea that t sub zero is going to be equal to zero, just to make our life a little bit easier. If you want to make a note of that, by all means, you just say let t sub zero equal zero. That's fine, but it is of the magnitude with respect to u. So of two du antiderivative of two with respect to u is two u over the interval of zero to t interval being the word of the day in which case i get s is equal to two t two t minus two times zero so two times zero goes away i'll write it so two times z uh, t minus two times zero. So S is equal to two T. What I would wanna do, and this is what I said before, uh, before as in like last week when we did number four, this is really S of T is equal to T. S of T is equal to two T, I should say. We need T of S. So if S is equal to two T, we could divide both sides by two and get T is equal to one half S. And now we have that relation where T of S is equal to one half S. All right. So now I know what T is in terms of S. I was going to say, because I see a 2t over here in my side example. I was like, could I choose a side example that's exactly the same as the example? No, it's just coincidence. All right. So let me just shrink a little bit. Let's 
All right. So now what I can do is since I'm looking for arc length parameterization, I can now take my original function, my original vector value function. Uh, let me just do that with a quicker highlighter. Take my original vector value function and replace every T with a one half S. All right. So therefore, R of S, right? Because it's going to be really R of T of S, right? Because T is now in terms of S. I could actually write, let me write that into the root stuff. Would be equal to two cosine T of S, comma two sine T of S. Definitely did not give myself enough room. So let me clean that up. Knowing that T of S is the same as one half S, I can now say that R of S, because ultimately the function is now in terms of S, two cosine one half S comma two sine one half s. And so what that does is it, it kind of takes us right back to the, really the beginning of the course, but also the beginning of this lesson so long ago now. Recording that off a little bit. The idea that you're hiking up a mountain you could be, I think I have the diagram at the top here. You could be looking at your position relative to some fixed point out in space, or you could be looking at your position relative to a position previous or prior in your journey, right? So that's what we did here is we went from thinking about a point out in space, that would be R of T, specifically the origin, versus a previous step along your journey, right? So that's what our arc length parameterization gives us. Right? But it also is a step towards finding what's called the curvature of a function, right? or at least it helps us understand what that actually means when we do come across that idea. All right? So hopefully that's a little bit better, but yeah. And, and the typos have already been submitted for this, but yeah, that, that, was, that was a big one. It really, honestly, it should have been the simple example should be example four. Five should say five, and then example four should be example six with some sort of indicator that you wouldn't be able to go beyond a certain step. Right? So that's all stuff that can be uh, fixed for the future. All right, now you see number six and seven are in general terms, all right? So number six is actually very similar to what we just did. So I don't wanna rob you of the joy of tackling that one on your own. I'm now going to put a star on that and hopefully that'll have more meaning because you look at it and at least feel like you have a fighting chance of being able to do it. But we're going to jump to number seven because now we're looking at something that's happening in three dimensions. All right, find the arc length parameterization for a helix of radius R that passes through the point R, passes through RU, R O O, R zero zero, and completes one full turn over a vertical distance of H, ROH, uh, ROH is another point on the curve, all right? So we have that information and what we need to do is one, I suppose, first come up with the vector value function that'll get that, get that mission accomplished, if you will, all right? So we're looking at something that's going from R comma zero comma zero. So that's this location here. It completes one full turn, all right? The radius is R, it's a fixed radius, all right? So that tells us that we have a distance here of R. This point here is elevated somewhat, all right? It just doesn't look like it, 
but it's elevated somewhat off the axis. In fact, it's probably, if it's a perspective drawing, the elevation is probably somewhere over here. Also sharing a radius of R. All right. As it works its way around, as you work your way around the helix, no matter where you are, the radius from the center is still going to be R units. But the problem is, and I actually kind of drew that in slightly incorrectly. Let me just fix that. Just this dang thing keeps autocorrecting on me. Let's see if I can resize it. Something like that. Because there's going to be an elevation. The distance from the, the origin is going to vary, but the distance from the vertical will remain fixed at R. All right, so let me just draw that in there. I'll draw this vertical and kind of accentuate it. So no matter where you are, your distance from that vertical, just a, it's a matter of kind of getting it to look kind of right, uh, that's going to remain fixed at R. All right, so this will be, for example, here, H units up. I'm going to kind of make that try to look parallel. So that's also going to have a radius of R. All right, but the bottom line is it's a circular helix. And so what a circular helix has in terms of a structure is three components. The first two are that of a circle in parametric form. The last component is the height, all right, or represents the height. So we, could, we can kind of play around with this idea, but after one full turn, we should be back to where we started in terms of the X and Y components, but now have a height of H, all right? So we can kind of think about it in terms of um, thetas, for example. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. So let's say you have a vector value function, a vector value function of, well, I'll use, I'll use R's here. Why did that move on? That should not be. Okay. Uh, R cosine theta. I'll use T. R sine T. And then let's say, for example, the last piece is, I'll, I'll, I'll make it a fixed value. And I'll show you what that looks like in GeoGebra. Right. So let's say it's, For example, three calculator, hopefully that's the right one. But GeoGebra, as we know, it's kind of a pain to type it all in, but we just deal with it. Let me get a little bit more width here. All right, so you just gotta, you gotta know the language and also know the little tricks. Curve. And that's one of the reasons why I say you're probably in pretty good shape when it comes to uh, the second tech assignment because it's re related to parametrics on GeoGebra. So we've been doing this fairly frequently. Oh, I just realized I'd actually have to put a number in here because I don't want to create a slider. So let me just say that this is, uh, I'll say they're all twos, twos across the board. I'll show you what happens here. All right, so let's say we have two cosine t comma two sine t that's not a t, t. <clears throat> comma t oh comma two Tell it what the variable is, t, and then just give it a reasonable domain. I had a parentheses instead of a comma for some reason. I want the two comma t comma, and then a reasonable domain like um, we'll go like zero to ten. All right. So you look at that and you say, okay, it's a, it's a circle. All right. We got it. So. 
if you if you do a top down view, you see it's a circle with a radius of two. I'll get it so that it's X Y with Z coming out at you. Circle radius of two, and now it also has a height of two. All right, so we just kind of discovered a relationship there. All right, and all that's telling us that is is that that last term there could impact the or does impact the height. All right, so if it's a constant, all it's going to do is elevate your circle or whatever your two dimensional figure is into a Z plane other than zero, right? So that part should be okay. So then what happens, uh, let me just move an eraser here. If instead of having a two there, let's see if this, this is not gonna glitch on me. I, I learned the little trick of hitting on the geometry tool, then going back and then sometimes it lets me do what I needed to do. I don't know. Starting to get a handle on this a little bit. So then I'm going to lock this in. And now I see I definitely have something that's a little bit not blatantly circular. But what I want to do again is a top down view. All right, looks like a semicircle. Let's go out to 20. All right, so it's giving me a little bit more, a little bit more spiral. Well, let's say I go out to like a hundred. All right, so I'm allowing T to go from zero to a hundred. All right, so in terms of the actual value, you know, oh, I'm sorry, the actual curve, zero to a hundred isn't really doing anything more than at least in that view than zero to 10 did. But if I zoom out, you see I'm getting a whole lot more, right? So I zoom out and then I bring it back in and you see I have a pretty nice looking spiral there, right? Now, if I wanted to just do the top down view, I, so I see that it's still a circle or it appears to be, but that's because we have lots of layers that are overlapping one another, right? So then the big question here would be, all right, so if I put a T here, that's great. Is that going to get me where I need to go? As in, after one full turn, will I be at that particular height? All right. So let's say, in this case, it's saying that we have R00 going to R0H. All right. So that's telling us that the radius is R. All right. So we're allowing for, so I can leave that at two, allowing for the height to be some other, some other value. All right. So Let's say I make this go to, I'll go two pi, one full turn. All right, so that got me there. Looking at it, it seems like it's terminating at a point after, after two pi radians it appears that it's terminating at a point that's directly over the point in question. Uh, I'm sorry, the point in question, like I'm just saying stuff now. Uh, the, the point I started at, right? So if I do a top down view, it appears that if I go with a model where I let T be variable, as long as I select an appropriate domain, I can get it to terminate at a point directly over where it started, which kind of makes sense because it will have completed one full cycle, all right? So then what, what happens if I make this, for example, 2T? Nope, oh, I put the two, I put the two in the wrong place. I'm like, what do they do wrong? The algebra is broken. No, it's not. And now it's going to be like a jerk about it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, it just corrected itself. Okay. okay. All right. So now you can kind of hopefully see that it's overshooting it a little bit. It's just kind of hard to tell. All right. It's going instead of going around the one time, it's going around a second time. It's just a zoom feature is a little crazy. So going to T, yeah, that's great. But then I would have to modify my domain in order in order to account, account for that.
All right. It's being weird now. Okay. Well, anyway, so you get the idea that we just need to have a variable D component in order for this to play out the right way. As long as we state our domain appropriately, we can pretty much put whatever we want. In there. Moral of the story. I just wish you guys would go with Right. So R or T, that's my vector value function. And then again, making the statement that if I if I want this to only exist for one full turn, I would say from zero to two pi, for example. So this is going to make multiple turns uh, for a helix that passes through those points. It doesn't say anything about restricting it. So we're fine. We don't even have to restrict the domain. We just want to be mindful that we should under certain circumstances. All right. Because if I only wanted one full turn, then I'd have to make a note that that's something uh, specific to the problem, right? Um, yeah, I think I, I might have lost my zero. In there. I, I don't even know. Oh, no, actually, that should have been it. I, I don't even know. Anyway, so still the same approach, though. So derivative. Sorry, skip the step. Let t equal u of t. I do want to skip a step. I just don't want to skip too many of them. So R of U is going to be equal to two cosine U, comma two sine of U, comma U, R prime of U, All right? So negative two sine U, two cosine U, and a one magnitude four sine squared u plus four cosine squared u plus one under a radical. All right, so kind of learned from the previous go round here that this part. It's really four times the sine squared plus cosine squared. Since sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one, it's really four times one under the radical. So this whole thing is going to amount to a radical five, right? Because this whole piece here is just going to be a four plus the one of the five under the radical. So principal root. So I don't care about the plus or minus part of it. Yeah, that that radical built into the model. Anyway. All right, so then it's just a matter. So now we have the magnitude, the matter of finding the arc length going from zero to T of the square root of five du. So rad five u over the interval of zero to T, which would be rad five T minus rad five u, but we've crossed that bridge before. All right, so we know now that S can be thought of as rad five u uh, times T which tells me that T could be thought of as one over rad five S. And so therefore R of S would be equal to two cosine one over rad five S comma two sine the same thing. Is it R of S or R of T? Now, now it's R of S because we made the substitution, right? Because this is this is the same as saying T of S. Oh, okay. So this is R of T of S. Yeah. Which simplifies down. Good question. And then from there, let me just shrink a little bit here actually kind of surprising that I have somewhat appropriate amount of space to do a problem for a change so that's kind of nice for everyone. So one over radical five times S would be the third component. And so that would be your vector value function parameterized in terms of arc length. Right. So really all we're doing uh, this whole process is really just for the purpose of Finding a relationship between T, which 
oftentimes represents time, but not always, and arc length so that we can make a substitution. And again, all that's going to do is give us a way of measuring movement along a curve with respect to some point that's already on the curve rather than some other point out in the space. You know. <clears throat> It's kind of like uh, if you go back to even learning about parabolas from uh, you know algebra class, if you were to uh, you know think about a point on the curve and how it related to a point that immediately pre preceded it, it, it would it would take on a different feel than it would if you were to just plot the point x comma y x comma y x comma y it's always back to the origin x comma y x comma y you know instead of doing that you start off at one point you know just actually that's a good way to think about it <clears throat> because if you were to plot just a simple parabola kind of like the way you would align you plot your vertex and then you'd say okay so from my vertex i'm going to move over one up one all right now from that point I'm gonna move over one up three. And then from that point, I'm gonna move over one up five. You know, it's like, where are those numbers coming from? That's parameterization in terms of movement along a curve rather than from some fixed point into it. Right. It's very weird, but also interesting. Which brings us to the concept indirectly to a unit tangent vector because between this concept and what we just talked about, We'll be able to kind of build towards the uh, the idea of curvature, All right? So, you know, you got the uh, the whole spiel there about it, but a unit tangent vector, it's really just a unit vector related to a tangent vector. So, a tangent vector is the derivative of your original vector value function. Okay, so we've been doing that. All we're doing now is finding the unit vector of that tangent vector. We call that capital T of lowercase t, t of t. Capital T representing the unit tangent and the lowercase t is the variable or the argument within the tangent. Okay, so number eight, you know, we start getting into the realm of mathematics where we, we, we don't like polynomials anymore because they start to become not convenient anymore. They used to be really convenient. You had a choice between working with a polynomial or some transcendental function. It was like, oh, give me the polynomial any day of the week. Now it's getting to the point where it's like, oh man, polynomials are a pain, right? And, and this is an example, right? So R prime of T, that's, that's not the part that makes it a pain. So R prime of T, at, at you probably, come to grips by, uh, by now with the idea that I, I prefer the uh, component form. I, I just find it more convenient, All right? So 6t plus two, sometimes you can't get away from it, but if I have a choice, I go component. All right? So negative 12t squared and six, All right? I then need the magnitude And that's where polynomials stop being convenient, all right? Because then you look at this and say, okay, wait, so I got to square these values and then add them together and then take the square root. All right, well, that sucks officially. So I'm going to write it as 6t plus 2 squared and then 144 t to the fourth plus 36, just for a little bit of convenience. Then I guess simplify a little bit if possible. And there's a 24 t plus four plus all that other stuff. I'll put a fresh new radical over it.
combine like terms if possible? Factor, if possible. I mean, I'll take a quick look. I'm not going to spend too much time dilly dallying with this because if I do, then you know. so let's just put it this way. I got I got better uses of my time, and so do you. But it's worth it to have a quick look. And by quick look, I mean just check the roots and see if there's anything clean. Make sure you type it incorrectly, though. I'm usually the only person that has to worry about that, but now it's a uh, fourth degree function. So it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to have the same kind of infinity as its extremes. Hey, you can put y equals if you want. It's not necessary with Desmos, but that's what we're looking at there. So it's parabolic in nature. Uh, we can we can bring it out if we want just to see. It doesn't seem to ever turn back on itself. So. And kind of what we're looking at. I don't see any x intercepts. So, uh, if anything, I'm going to get some uh, imaginary roots, which I'm not interested in. All right. So, all we would get here <clears throat> is pain. No, uh, it's really not that bad. It's just we got to do a fair amount of writing in order to get our result. So, t of t is going to be the quotient. of your derivative vector, all right? So that's your tangent vector. Let's just shrink this down a little bit. A little spacing. What on earth is he doing? Well, he's getting ready to make this whole thing the denominator for each component. So I even need more space. I'm going to shrink this down as much as I can go. Shrink these down. Yeah, so polynomials suck. You used to like them a lot. Remember the good old days? It used to be preferred even. Now they're like, look how much of a pain in the ass it is to work with these things. So that is your unit tangent vector. You can make some little fraction bars, but I'm gonna make the, uh, the radical serve as the fraction bar, so. There you go. Oof. Look at that. And some people want to get kind of lazy and write it as uh, one over the R, you know, magnitude of R prime of T as the coefficient. And I say, well, no, no, you got to, I want you to write the whole shebang. Right. So that being said, I'm never going to ask you to write anything that requires this much uh busy work i guess because it doesn't really bring anything to the conversation all right but that that's that's pretty hideous but it would tell us a vector of magnitude one that is tangent to any um vector along the curve right so we'll get into the visuals of what that means as we go but it's um, not quite as simple as saying the slope of the line tension to the curve at any point along the curve. You know, it's not quite that simple, but it's it's kind of there. Okay. So, um, number nine, same general idea as what I said on the previous page, where I didn't want to rob you of the opportunity of trying that on your own first. I'm going to put a star on that one. Uh, number ten 
is kind of along the same lines as number eight, except it's in two dimensions. So it's a little bit more, it's more of a friendly problem. So I think, uh, I think you can handle that one also. So I'll put a couple stars on this problem there. So we're gonna hop on over to page 37 now. But yeah, the unit tangent vector is pretty simple concept uh, in terms of actually the, the process of how you find it. You're just finding the derivative of each component, finding the magnitude, and then dividing the magnitude into each component of your derivative vector or your tangent vector. Right? So it's what we do with it that's actually going to matter. Right? And so that brings us to the concept of uh, curvature. And so you kind of see that number 11 and number 10 are the same vector value functions, but this one's at a point, so it's going to be a little bit easier to manage. Uh, so the process for finding uh, curvature, there's this idea that we're differentiating the unit tangent vector with respect to the arc length, right? And so that that's kind of a doozy conceptually, right? So what I did here is instead of boring you with the derivation itself, because curvature is really talking about, you know, you have... And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, I'll call it a simplistic explanation. You know, I, I kind of let, I, I kind of got into this a little bit, but if you have a line and you have a circle, uh, circle, come on, start looking like a circle for crying out loud. Okay, well, whatever, an ellipse. It's pretty clear and easy to see that this one is going to have a curvature value. And this is how I make my curvature symbol. The, it's supposed to be the Greek letter kappa, but I can't make I can't make a kappa. So I make a funky looking K. So I actually just put three parabolas together and call it a K. Anyway, that's that's my kappa. That's just how I make it. Right. It's a physical inability to make the appropriate kappa. Anyway, that curvature value, if I said that that's going to be equal to zero. No, I don't think anybody's going to argue. I tell you it has no curvature. You say, yeah, I agree. Why? Because it's not a curve. Well, it is a curve, but it's not a curvy curve. You know, a line is a special form of curve of a curve where the curvature value is equal to zero. All right, but you try telling that to a high school freshman or a middle schooler, you know, that's not going to float. Right? But if I tell you that this value, this curvature value, Parabola, parabola is going to be greater than zero. I don't think you're doubting that either, because you know it's going to have some value that represents its curviness, because it does have curvature. You just don't know necessarily what that value is going to be. And that's fine. That's why we're here. All right. What we do is we talk about the tangent vector and how it relates per unit of change in arc length, right? So let me focus in on the one that actually has the curve because it's easier to, to demonstrate. So let's say you have a point on that curve. And actually, let me get that kappa out of there. Make it small. And let's say that there's some fixed point in the center because this ellipse is defined as a vector value function, right? Traced out by whatever that vector is. And so here's my R of T, right? So that R of T traces out a series of points along the circumference of this oblate ellipse, I guess. I don't even know what to call it, right? So what we have here, if I can get it to look correctly, yeah, close enough, is a tangent vector. So this is a tangent vector. All right. So it's tangent to the surface or the, the points that are traced out by the curve. All right. That's defined as R prime of T. Mm 
Okay. What we want to do is find the rate of change for that, that tangent vector. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, tangent vector. I don't know. Um, we, we convert that into a unit tangent vector. So we, with a magnitude of one that we call T of T, this little guy here has a magnitude of one. By definition, a unit tangent has a magnitude of one. All right. We're going to find the rate of change of that in comparison to each little infinitesimal movement along the surface or along the uh, circumference because this is a two-dimensional two figure of the curve so as it goes from here to here that would be a dx as it goes from here to here another ds here to here ds all these little ds's right what happens is and now you've seen my inability to draw but what i can tell you is that you're going to get a little bit of a difference in your unit tangent vector for every one of those little movements. So every one of those little teensy tiny movements in S is going to lead to a little bit of a fluctuation in the unit tangent. So I'm, I'm trying to like kind of make it a little bit more I'm, I'm sort of exaggerating the change so it's a little bit more obvious, even though this isn't technically how it would look for this particular figure. I just wanted to kind of uh, emphasize it. So each one of these T of T's in relation to the DS would create a ratio, all right? The magnitude of that ratio of those, those the collection of those ratios would give you the curvature. All right. And what we can do is focus on that curvature at a point or at any point. All right. So each one of these would represent a T of T specific to its location within the, the curve itself. All right. So that's a little bit of the theory behind it. But what this tells us is that we're going to get some number that represents the curvature of this, uh, this figure. And it's related to this idea. However, Working with this in its current form would be a nightmare, right? Because what it tells us that we would have to do is figure out, you know, all this stuff that's under the recall over here, all of this stuff, you'd have to do that every time. So two pages ago, so all this stuff here, here, even the little side example required a, bu required a bunch of steps. You'd have to do that. And then on top of that, you'd have to figure out the unit tangent vector, put it all together in, in order to find the measure of the curvature, which is, which is a pain. But what we can do is modify this in such a way that it allows us to come up with a little bit of a shortcut. And this is that shortcut. So if you read through this proof, it's actually pretty nifty. I didn't want to bore you with the actual construction of the proof, but it has it has to do with the chain rule. It gives you from dt dt uh, dt ds, it gets you to t prime of t, s prime of t, which should make a, a fair amount of sense. But it's the key component that the derivative of your arc length is going to be equivalent to the derivative of the magnitude of the vector value function derivative. I said derivative twice there. Derivative of the arc length would be equal to the magnitude of the vector value functions derivative. That relationship comes from the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, so if you remember that one, this is from calc one. Although it's most commonly skipped, which is why I don't um, go through this proof because it, it falls on deaf ears in a lot of cases. But <clears throat> what it tells us is that if we have, if we're looking for the derivative with respect to x on the interval of 
you know, really doesn't doesn't matter. So zero, I'll say a u of x of some function of t and t, the result is f of x, f of u of x, really. All right, so that concept would come into play and it's not pretty, All right, at least in terms of the derivation. Uh, times u prime of x, sorry, we ran out of room. I'm just gonna smidge it over. So this is fundamental theorem of calculus part two. Sometimes it's part one, depending on the textbook. But it's kind of aggravating because uh, the other part of the fundamental theorem of calculus is really very easy. It's the one where you take it's definite integrals. It's where you take the antiderivative and plug in the upper and lower bounds. This is a lot more complicated, but you know, doable, just more complicated, right? So for some folks, it means okay by processes of black magic we end up with this shortcut rule, which actually ends up being a lot easier because when we find T of T in that process, we're also finding the magnitude of R of T, uh, R prime of T, I should say. All right, so let me take you through an example, specifically at T equals zero, and I'll show you what, you know, what this is all about, all right? So we're looking for R prime of T, so 2t and 1. Now, this is at t equals 0. So every step of the way, I'm going to evaluate. So r prime of 0 is going to be 0, 1. The magnitude of r prime of t, we could do this in general terms, you know, using the vector value function's derivative, 4t squared plus 1. But then the magnitude of r prime of zero would have us replace the t with a zero, which would give you a one anyway. Now, because r prime of zero is equal to zero one, well, that's vector j, which has a magnitude of one, it's a unit vector, so it, it ought to be a one, all right? T of T is the derivative of the vector value function divided by the magnitude of the derivative of the vector value function. So I could, I could write that. In fact, I'm doing number 10 right now on the previous page just by doing it. You could write it as 2T over the square root of 4T squared plus 1, comma, 1 over the square root of 4T squared plus 1. But ultimately, I need to find the derivative of that at t equals zero. So I need t prime of zero. And then once I find that, I need the derivative of that, right? The reason why I say this problem isn't too bad is because it's specifically at a point. If I had to find the derivative of each part of this function, not too crazy, but it does involve quotient rule or chain rule or product rule or whatever rule you want to use. One of those three, two of those three, uh, but you'd have to do it. So the, the good thing is, or one of the good things, we could use Desmos and we could say here we have a function y equals 2x over the square root of 4x. Uh, let me write it, sorry, um, write it as f of x makes life a little easier. Um, 4x squared plus 1. Okay. And I just needed to do, do the quick computation for me. So I'll do it for the first part, and then I'll, I'll, I'll change the 2 into a 1. Or I'm sorry, the 2x into a 1, and then do it for the, the second component. So then all I'd have to write or type in would be f prime the little prime right next to the enter symbol, but you got to hit the up arrow to get there. 
Right? So it's just an apostrophe, right? F prime of zero flat out tells you that it's two. So then I just wanna do the same thing, but instead of it being two X over the square root of four X squared plus one, I just want it to be one over, so two one. So now if I'm looking for the magnitude of T prime, now magnitude of T prime of T, that would be a disaster. But magnitude of T prime of zero, that's not a problem at all. I mean, you do the work if you want, but it's just gonna be a two, all right? So the kappa value at T equals zero, or given that T is equal to zero, top number two, bottom number one, Result two. Okay. Just put it down there. And so that gives you the, the curvature of this function at t equals zero. You could test it for other points too. You know, the, the thing is you get you'd have to do a little bit of you know additional work to get there, but it's doable, you know, and in fact, t squared plus one comma t is a parabola at t equals zero, zero comma one, that's gonna be a turning point. That's, that's the curviest part of a parabola, the vertex, the turning point. So pick any other point, so try the same problem, but where t is equal to even one, you'll see that your kappa value is gonna be something less than two. Right, because it'll be less curvy the further you get away from the turning point. All right, but let's do one where we work in general terms. All right. So find the curvature of a circle of radius A in R2. All right, and you can see here, uh, number 13 is also a circle. You know, it's just a circle in three dimensions. For a, a curvature for any straight line, curva, curvature for a parabola. So this is the, the general case for the one that we just did. So I can already tell you, you're getting stars on each one of these babies. because They're kind of fun to work on. But the curvature for a circle, radius A. So R of T, A cosine T, A sine of T, R prime of T, negative A sine T, A cosine T, magnitude, square each part, add them together, but it doesn't take too long before you start realizing, oh wait, it's like the same every time when it comes to these circular functions. Okay, but you know, maybe you don't see it. The negative squares away. Factor out the a squared. So a squared times sine squared plus cosine squared. Sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. A squared times one is a squared. Square root of a squared is just a. Okay. Now, the unit vector related to the tangent vector, so the unit tangent vector is really just, again, this divided by this, we're looking at just negative sine of t, cosine of t. If I want the derivative of that, t prime of t, I get negative cosine t, negative sine of t. Right. The derivative of the unit tangent vector is not always going to be a unit vector, but in this case it will be because if I take the magnitude t prime of t, I 
I don't know why I was putting the vector there. Lord only knows. Cosine squared t plus sine squared t. Under the radical, the result is going to be one. All right, so our kappa value, which is the magnitude of t prime of t, at least the shortcut rule is, over the magnitude of r prime of t, fix that r, is going to be one over a. So my magnitude for any value of t is going to be one over a. Okay. Now that's kind of nice because it doesn't always play out that your curvature value is constant. In the case of a circle, the curvature value is, is going to be constant dependent on the radius. And in fact, since A represents the radius, what this tells us is that the curvature is dependent on uh, not only the fact that the radius is, is known, but also the, the, the inverse of that radius gives us the, the curvature. So it's telling us that a smaller circle is going to be curvier than a larger one. So if I tell you that you have a circle with a radius of one, its curvature is going to be one. But if I tell you the uh, circle with a radius of 5,280, then its curvature is going to be one over 5,280. All right. Now you got to be careful about units because maybe that one was one mile and that 5,280 was feet, which is also one mile. So its curvature value might seem different, but it's only because it's in different units. But I think it's probably easy to recognize, I'll just show you very quickly, that if I have something like r equals one versus r equals five, this purple circle is curvier than the black one. All right, just think about just actually drawing the purple circle versus the black one. Like you're gonna actually have to curve your, your drawing more in order to draw that purple one. You can make nice sweeping movements in order to draw the black one. And in fact, if you're just walking along the equator, you think you're walking along a, a straight line. The earth is flat, according to whichever basketball player said it was. But uh, yeah, and you know, it's people pre-Renaissance, but yeah, stupid people. But um, but yeah, like if, if you're on a circle that's big enough, it might seem to be linear, but that's because its curvature is so small. I mean, it's, it's, it's kappa value is so small, right? So you'll see, for example, like in number 14, find the curvature for any straight line. You come up with anything other than zero, then you done did it wrong, all right? The, the key to that one is to, to come up with a model that represents any straight line. Yeah, you could look up in a previous completed notes for this course and go that route, but you, I, I encourage you to also give it a shot on your own. Right? So that's the concept of curvature. Uh, motion in space, we've actually already done, you know, for the most part, because it's uh, it's really the idea of finding um, derivatives and things like that using uh, vector value functions. The one thing that we haven't really tackled is the concept of, um, you know, applications of it, right? So like force, you know, F equals MA. So that's what I wanted to do as the last thing that we would do for tonight. You know, just the idea that we can, and, and there are some extra problems on here that I, I don't even know why I put in there, to be honest with you. But it's really just uh, number one and number two that we care about. Uh, <clears throat> these are just interesting problems that can be done using other techniques, but it's nice to, it's nice to know the origin story behind these things. You know, because people who have a physics background, they've seen problems like this. They know that there's a formula to be used. and I, I just enjoy sharing the idea of like, hey, all those formulas in physics, they came from the classes I teach, you know, so it's kind of interesting in that regard, all right? So the first one here, find the force acting on, an, on a two kilogram ball. 
Thanks. So force F equals M A. So we just kind of get that out there real quick. F equals M A mass times the acceleration acting on a two kilogram ball. Um, that would be the mass. Moving in a circular path of radius three with the period of rotation being 3.7 seconds. This is the first time we're talking about a period of rotation, right? So what that's telling us is the amount of time that it would take, so we're in, including a parameter here of time, the amount of time it would take to complete one full rotation, right? So it brings us back to the structure of a trigonometric function, right? So the period in a trig function is equal to two pi divided by the B value if the model is a circular function. Again, uh, we're working in two dimensions because it's a circular path. If R of T is going to be equal to cosine, you know, so we know the we know the radius is three, so I'll say three cosine b times t, three sine b times t, because now we're in, incorporating a period of time, you know, the period of rotation, but that implies that there's going to be a change in frequency, the coefficient in front of the variable within a trig function represents, that's not what I wanted to look like, represents the frequency. And so those B values are frequencies. And in order to be a circular function, those frequency values have to be consistent with one another. The coefficient, the A values, the leading coefficients, those are also amplitudes. But if its amplitude is the same in the cosine direction and in the sine direction, then it's going to be circular. Right? So that part's consistent. If I, if I said it was an elliptical path, then your amplitude values would differ from one component to the other. But they're telling us that the period of time it takes to complete one full cycle, aka the definition of period, is 3.7 seconds. Then, and I'm sorry and that's equivalent to two pi divided by B, then we know that B has to be equal to two pi divided by 3.7. You know, a little cross multiplication and solving, right? So that gives us a constant multiple for T that is not a very appealing looking two pi over 3.7, right? If you wanna work in degrees, you can, but it's not gonna be much better, so. Uh, I'm just going to leave it in radian form. All right. So three cosine two pi over 3.7 times time, with the same idea being in place for the uh, the sine function. All right, so this function allows for the fact that it takes 3.7 seconds to complete one full cycle, as long as t is in seconds. All right, there has to be an agreement within the units there. All right, and so if you kind of think about it related to those units, the two pi represents an angle. So this is a theta, this is an angle, radians, or degrees. This is in seconds, so time, specifically in seconds. So this T here also represents time. So if I take radians, 
seconds and multiply it by another unit of seconds, then it, seconds would cancel out and I'd just be left with radians, right? So cosine of the radian measure would play out the way we wanted to. So everything would all, it would all work out the right way. Right? That's the whole idea. I just need to steal back some room now. All right, so we're looking for the force acting on this two kilogram ball. Well, I know the mass, I just need the acceleration. Well, derivative of position and the vector value function does give us the position along the curve or the, in this case, the circle, which is good. So the second derivative would give us, uh, so r of t gives us position. So the first derivative, the first derivative would give us velocity. The second derivative would then give us acceleration. So we have a recipe here. We just got to get there. Okay, so r prime of t, cosine goes to negative sine, but then we also have to take the derivative of the inner function. So this is going to become negative 3 times 2 pi over 3.7 cosine of 2 pi over 3.7. Uh, and by cosine, I mean sine. Apologies. Times time, comma, same deal, except it's going to be a positive three and it's going to have a cosine. So I just got to change that sign to a cosine and we'll have a velocity vector. All right, so that's our velocity vector. I could find the magnitude of that, in which case I would know the velocity at any time t, but I need acceleration. So second derivative. Sine goes to cosine, cosine of two pi over 3.7 t. So sine, if I take the derivative of sine of two, point, two pi over 3.7 t, it would go to cosine two pi over 3.7 t times another two pi over 3.7. Okay. So we're gonna end up with, it's gonna be a joy to write, but we're gonna end up with the constant multiples multiplied by another 2 pi over 3.7. So I'm just going to write this as 2 pi over 3.7 squared cosine 2 pi over 3.7 t. And then all the same stuff again, except with a sign. So then we got to find the magnitude of this. And that's going to be the acceleration. Right? Because what we have now is an acceleration vector. I need the actual acceleration. So I'm going to square each part, add them together, and everything is just going to be green. So we're going to have 9, 2 pi over 3.7, now to the fourth power, cosine squared of 2 pi over 3.7 t. Plus, same stuff, just now with a sine function incorporated in. Cleaning it up as usual. I'm going to have to slap a radical over this thing in a second anyway. So this is going to be a sine. What 
with the radical over the whole shibidi bangity. That's not a radical. Kind of. The handwriting took a walk on me here, so I'm just tidying it up. Give you a second word of the day here, tidy. T-I-D-Y, tidy. All right. So, eh, it still doesn't look much better, but at least it's an attempt. I got all this stuff here. It looks pretty nasty, but embedded in this nastiness, just like we've seen before, is the cosine squared plus sine squared part of it. So if we factor out the GCF, I'm going to over highlight this a little bit. The GCF isn't too pretty. It's the nine, two pi over 3.7 to the fourth. We could factor that out and we'll just be left with the stuff that's highlighted in yellow. Cosine squared plus sine squared, no matter what's inside, always goes to one, assuming that what's inside exists. That's the important piece, right? So, so it just means that this whole thing is gonna boil down to really just this part. Okay, maybe, maybe that was too much. It's really just gonna boil down to just this part. Because if you factor out that GCF, that stuff in purple, pull it out of the whole thing, it cleans up nicely, well, nicely is a relative term, to three times two pi over 3.7 of the quantity squared. So that's the measure of acceleration. Now the units are important, right? We don't just say, especially for contextual situations, we don't just say, oh, here's a number, now go take it and go to hell. No, it's, here's a number, now what does it mean? All right, we started off with a measure of position that was in meters, all right? So meters. Then it went, we took the derivative with respect to time, so then it became meters per second. So now with our second derivative, we're up to meters per second squared. All right, so that's all acceleration. Now, if I want the force, F equals MA, I know that the force itself is two kilograms. I'm sorry, the force, geez, the mass is two kilograms. MA, so two kilograms multiplied by this. So we're gonna get as a result six, multiplied by two pi over 3.7 squared with the units being just the, the multiplication of the kilograms and meters per second squared. All right, so six multiplied by two pi over three, I mean, you can put that in a calculator and see what that is mathematically, you know, mathematically, computationally, but that's not really important. It's just a number, all right? A kilogram meters per second squared, uh, that's very meaningful, right? Because through this process of carrying out a derivative and then a, a second derivative, we discover the units meters per second squared, multiply that by kilograms, and now we have these brand new units. Now, if you don't have a background in physics, then you wouldn't know necessarily what those units are called. So I could call them whatever I want. You know, I would imagine that the person who first discovers a unit or a rule gets to name them after themselves. 
So if I had no experience in physics, I'd say kilogram meters per second squared. I'm going to call it that. I'm going to call those hands. That's, that's my last name. Some people forget that. Hand. Some people think my last name is Khan. So, I mean, this is kind of a moment of clarification. Okay, so, yeah, I discovered this. Kilogram times meters per second squared. Everybody. We're gonna, from now on, we're gonna call those hands. As it turns out, I wasn't the first person to discover this. Some clown by the name of Newton did. And I'm sure he wasn't the first one to discover it. He was just the first one to publish. I, I, I kind of zoned out in that part of history of math uh, because it was senior year of college and we was getting a little lazy. But yeah, this, this, this would be a Newton. All right, so kilogram meters per second squared is also known as a Newton. You do not need to know this. That's, hey, great, if you know it, cool. This, this is definite. So this comes from the math. This is what we just did. Oh, we built this. We started with meters, then we went meters per second, meters per second squared, and then we incorporated kilograms to arrive at this brand new set of units that represent force. We discovered that. This is just saying, uh, I remember somewhere along the lines that every time I write force, I just put an N at the end. Eh, it doesn't mean as much to me. And a kilogram meters per second squared means a whole heck of a lot more. Right? Just like uh, when you take a the, the next unit test and this almost exact problem is on there, I can tell you the only thing, uh, th this problem will be on there. It won't be a two kilogram ball. It won't be a radius of three, and it won't be a period of rotation of 3.7 seconds. It might be a three kilogram ball and a circular path of radius nine, you know, whatever. I'm looking for this approach. I'm not looking for whatever cool formula you learned in a physics class. That's great. I'm sure it helped you there. I'm looking for you to demonstrate that you, you know the calculus behind that, because th this is really kind of a derivation. If we work with this in general terms, we could discover a formula that can be used to represent force in a circular path, right? Which brings us to the second example, uh, which I'm going to leave you with tonight. And I and, and the third one we're not going to bother with because it's really it's almost it's it's almost too easy, right? So I'm going to toss that one. The first two are actually good enough. We've done enough uh, finding derivatives and antiderivatives of uh, vector value functions as mission accomplished, all right? So the next class, we'll go over all the star problems, but we're also gonna get on to um, partial derivatives and then go from there, all right? So we've got a good chunk of stuff ahead of us, but uh, we're, we're starting to get ahead of steam here, all right? Uh, I'm also going to, because I know I've been keeping you late the last bunch of classes, I'm gonna, I'm actually shockingly not going to work you right up until the buzzer this time. So that's where we're going to end it this evening. If you have any questions, stick around. Otherwise, enjoy the, uh, the remainder of your evening, and I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.